stand clear. 100% Wild Podcast. So for all you listeners, hello and welcome to Definitely Not Your Favorite Outdoor Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. And we are powered by DeerCast. You're Tim Chelswick. You are Matt Drury. And today, we're going to give people the whitetail edge. Ah, we got Mr. Uh Ben Rising on with us right now. What's up, Ben? Uh, Not much, guys. How are you all doing? Good. Hey, it's been been cool to see, you know, the show there in DeerCast and and to see you kind of... posting inside there you know every other week or so it's been fun to keep up with you guys and see kind of how your last season went but i'm really excited to see how this upcoming season is going to go because you had a pretty phenomenal season last year you're going to be able to top it i don't know (laughs) (laughs) no pressure i'm a little worried about it because we were just in kentucky for two days and it didn't go as planned so (laughs) hopefully that's not going to be the way it's supposed to go but we'll see You've been at it a long time, so you know how it goes. It's like when you have that oh, yeah. that good year, boy, look out for that next year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. You get humbled real quick. So, first uh, uh, pays off, but yeah, we just had bad rain and then 90 degree heat. I only had two days to, to try to do it. It's so, tough. But I'll go back. Yeah. We should let folks know that Ben is traveling right now. So if we get a little audio artifact that's that's why he's doing whitetail business that's right when you're a big buck killer people want to know how you get it done that's the biggest thing that i always see from mark and terry it's like they just people just want to understand it a little bit more it's like it's some sort of special code and Mm -hmm. guys like ben and mark and terry you know there's tons of people out there obviously that that have somewhat cracked the code but i don't know if you ever totally crack it i mean you've been at it a long time in your opinion is it that you what what gives you that edge that white tail edge exactly whoa, whoa. um i i mean i you know i think it's just i think a lot of it, it's intuition it's a gut feeling too of like what move to make you know where where to set up where to do things how to read sign woodsmanship things like that mm-hmm. um and I, i've you know and it there's i've said it before on here and I, I probably have said this on every podcast but it's like one of the most things that has stuck with me since i heard it and mark dury said it to me one time we were turkey hunting and with a guy and this guy was struggling to hit turkeys and mark was getting a little upset <laughs> but surprise yeah, you're missing like his miss like like after he missed his third turkey that oh. day mark was just like beside himself and uh he, he he just looks at me and he goes you know ben he goes there's people that like to hunt there's hunters and there's killers he goes this guy just likes to hunt <laughs> and man that has just stuck with me forever like but i do believe there's really something to that because there's some guys that it don't, it, I don't think it's ever going to matter. Like they're never going to be that guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then there's some that can develop and learn. And then there's some that just come by it naturally. You know what I mean? It's just, they just do. I don't know how you say it. Sounds like Matt and I are screwed. If I'm reading I was wondering if it was me that he was talking about. <laughs> I don't remember messing uh, a turkey three times. Oh, but. <laughs> no, it was a guy that used to write the backs of your DVDs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. John. John was his name. <laughs> Let's dox him. Where does he live? Means, I, I know who that is. Up, yeah. He's turned into like a killer. And, yeah. That's good. I mean, we're talking like 2005, 2006. Yeah. That's he's actually killed some pretty twice. big deer since then. Uh, so, good. you know, when I when I think about it, I, I I feel like the other thing that separates you guys would be you, you talk about your gut instinct, intuition, you know, kind of killability, (laughs) you know, some people just have a factor, Mm -hmm. but I also think about that. It's almost a a thing where, you know, how to, you talk about it, it's an instinct where, you know, what they're about to do. Like, I just, I don't know. I think it's a next level, the amount of work and effort that you 
you might have this knowledge, but you still put the work and the effort in every day, all day, you know, all the way leading up to the season, all the way through the season. And I always feel like that's what really separates a true Mm -hmm. deer killer. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, I've been working in the woods ever since I was young, you know, and, you know, law I trade, you know, buy timber every day, meet with landowners and, you know, and then my job affords me that time to be in the woods, you know, and do things and learn and always walk in different properties and um, just seeing what the deer are doing, you know, and always trying to learn from it. Um, sometimes it all like it was too much, you know, I mean, I start, you know, sometimes I take it for granted, I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely a big help in me learning the deer. Yeah. It, th- there's an old saying, the harder you work, the luckier you, you get. I think that's kind of like encapsulating what, what you're saying yeah. there, Ben, is like you yeah. can have all the intuition you want, but unless you, you're willing to put in the sweat equity, it's just, you know, it, it's not going to take you to that next level. Yeah. Well, I was telling, so like the, the guy, the young guy that's working with me, some Dylan, uh, we were just in Kentucky together and, you know, the weather wasn't the greatest. We were going to leave and go home. But I said, you know, before we go, I want to make some adjustments, do it now. That way they're done. I feel like don't put off t- tomorrow what you can do today. You know, if there's things that, you know, need to be done, do them, mm-hmm. you know. And, like, I don't play baseball. I don't play softball. I don't golf. I don't, you know. So my, a lot of my free time when I'm not doing stuff for family or if I'm working, it's revolved around being on deer ground you know, doing stuff with the farms that I own or that I lease or or places I have permission to hunt or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's just always something to be done, you know, um, seems like. That's one of the hardest times because you you mentioned just doing some work down in Kentucky after the hunt. After the hunt, like, I want to get back home. I just want to, I want to go eat something. I want to go back home and get, get changed and relax a little bit. Those are the hardest times. I think those, that is a real separator of people who are hunters versus killers. Cause you're willing to stick it out. But the, that's a, you know, you get kind of complacent in the fact that you live close to where you hunt. That would be one downfall of, you know, it's, there's a lot of convenience there, mm-hmm. but the one downfall would be like, eh, I'll get it. You know, I can swing back through here. I've had that thought a lot. Yeah. And, and what Ben's saying, you know, Kentucky to Ohio, I don't know how long your drive was, but it's like, all right, we got to do this before we go back home. So when we come back, we get ready, we get right up into the tree mm-hmm. and we're ready to kill, you know? And, and so that, that is a big, I think that is a, a big difference there too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. And like, so like when I was, I just picked up this lease like two weeks ago down in Kentucky. And so I've never hunted. I don't know it that well. Yeah, I don't know where the deer bed. I don't know what they're doing. And I didn't want to tromp all through the timber, you know, trying to find all that before hunting the edges. Cause I want to start on the edges and just see what the deer did. So when I first went down to actually set it up, I was, I literally hung stands for every wind direction. I didn't really need to possibly, mm-hmm. but I felt like I needed to be prepared because if you're driving four hours to go to a place to hunt, you don't know what the wind, you never know what's going to happen. So I just felt like I, I needed to have something already set up or trimmed, at least sticks in a tree or something mm-hmm. so I could easily hang a stand in and be ready to go. And I'm, you know, so it's just, I think a lot of those little things, you know, as far as like being ahead if you're going to a place that you can hunt you know there's times when you're going out of state that maybe only got five days to hunt. you've never been on a property well that's when i feel like grinding and being smart as far as like starting on the outside you know and then making those moves in inward and you know hunting put the hunting time in if you're only there for five days hunt you know um because you never know what could happen but find the sign you know hunt the you know, hunt the freshest stuff you can find as to what the deer are doing, in my opinion, at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, you may be stepping into areas you don't think you should, but when you've only got five or six days to do it, sometimes you have to. So are you doing e-scouting ahead of, you know, getting boots on the ground? Or, how, you know, what preparation have you done leading into that to kind of get a general idea of, I think these, you know, four different winds, here's, here's where I'm going to, you know, hang my stands. Yeah, stuff, yeah, I mean, as far as, like, looking at topos, like say using deer cast maps, you know, looking at the topographical features of the ground, 
you can tell by looking at aerial photographs where the thick timber is or where you know more thicker bedding areas should be compared to bigger stands of hardwoods because like when you're looking at the aerial through the map program you can see the treetops like big bulby bushy areas those are you know typically more mature timber when you start getting into that green foliage it looks like it just kind of runs together and it's all the same or there's some open pockets in it a lot of times that's you know cut off timber or you know brushy areas that you know are not mature so those areas those transition zones areas those benches where you can see the contour lines give it up you know three quarters of the way up the hill and it makes a bench a lot of times those deer will bet on those areas mm -hmm. just a lot of features you can look at that way and then try to make your adjustments or you know preliminary stand hangs accordingly are you getting i mean are you hanging as if it you're ready for the rut meaning getting deep into the timber or getting into the bedding area are you going in there and hanging on this first trip in preparation for a you know november hunt or are you staying off on the edges somewhat and perimeters yeah so on this hunt being kentucky is early you know i've never hunted as early as i just did this past weekend so i was staying on the edges of the fields mm -hmm. you know it's still really thick in the woods there is some acorns starting to finally drop in areas, but I just felt like not knowing the farm enough, I needed to stay on the perimeters, hunt the edges and, you know, attack it that way. See if I could pick out a pattern of a deer, or, you know, maybe find a weakness of what a deer's doing. Gotcha. So you've been killing big deer for a long time. And, and I'm curious what, like, what are you doing differently now than maybe you were doing 20 years ago? Like what, what are some of the key like principles that you have learned over time that you wish you would have known back then, but are putting in practice now? I would say one thing I do now is I hunt less, which isn't as fun, hmm. but you know, like you, you learn to hunt smarter, not harder. You know what I mean? You hunt hard when you have to, Mm -hmm. but hunt smarter to start with and normally you'll be more successful you know um, do you think that's because you're cutting down intrusion yeah some of it that and I, I i you know let's not kid ourselves the technology we have today with trail cameras and things like that have definitely advanced the game to where we can know a little more information mm -hmm. um to help us decide you know when's the best times to hunt and what area we need to be spending our time in, you know, you still have to be smart, put your cameras in the right spots, but the cameras really help develop patterns and movement, you know, things like that, that can kind of help us be patient, you know, to mm -hmm. where before when you didn't have a lot of that kind of stuff, um, sometimes you just had to put your time in, you know, until you could figure out those patterns by physical sightings. Sure. I've been keeping up with your episodes in DeerCast from uh, from last season's uh, hunts, and um, and I I love the fact that like like you're you're I think your and my theologies are very similar, and I know you make it a point to thank God after you take a deer. What about like what's your theology around a miss or a or a bad shot like? Are we thank are you thanking God for those circumstances too? Like how do you how does that fit into your into your worldview? You know, so I used to get so upset when like I would miss a deer or something wouldn't happen. But as I've gotten older, I've learned that I don't know, like I, it's all God's timing is how I look at it now. I really do. It's like it just wasn't meant to be, you know, maybe something is better in store. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like it always works out. Same, you know, you know, some people say, well, that's just karma or that's life. And, and, you know, maybe it can be, I choose to believe in a higher power and that's my, my belief, you know, and I, I believe in God. And I just feel like when you try to put him in that, um, as your compass, I guess you'd say, he's the one point that you're pointing North with him. Then I feel like things do fall into place better. You know, we all, make mistakes and mm -hmm. you know fail and fall backwards but i think it's that always trying to move forward and be good to people and you know I've, I've come a long way in that aspect of things but you know i 
I shouldn't say I sit there and I go, oh, thank you, God, for letting me miss that deer. I don't necessarily do that. <laughs> but, you know, I've learned to accept those things to where I don't get so – where, like, when I missed Roman, I it didn't, like, crush me. I was like, dang it, I missed that deer. It's not what I said at the time. But it didn't, like, fester in my head for days. Like, hmm. you know, before, I just kept after it. And I killed yeah. him two days later. Yeah. You know, made a bad shot. Something about that deer had mojo on me. But I finally got him killed. But – um, I've just learned to accept those things a little better when you do make mistakes and they're mm-hmm. going to happen. You know, when you spend as much time in a tree stand or hunting like guys like us do, there's going to be mistakes, you know? And I, I think everybody thinks that sometimes just because they see the footage that you just go out there and bam, you kill a deer and it just doesn't really work that way. You know, there's a lot more to it, a lot of grinding, a lot of, a lot of effort. So is, is that history with a deer in your head as you're at full draw? Like, you know, like, is it like, oh, this is the culminating moment of all this effort and a missed opportunity? Or are you just thinking, let's, let's do this right now? Yeah, for me, I, I'm really good about keeping my nerves in check, you know, and being able to pull off the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when I do that, once I shoot, then I fall apart as, you know, anybody that's watched me over the years and certain episodes, you know, certain deer, I really you know, certain ones I don't. It's just like, man, I got him. Yes. But there's certain ones that really mean a lot to you, you know, that um, it just, that I guess emotion just takes over, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. What, what advice would you give someone who maybe is struggling with buck fever, or just keeping it together in that moment? Okay. One, one of the things I tell like people is like, look, you've worked all this effort and all this time. And this was one of the things I had to start teaching myself because when I was younger, I, you know, y'all struggle with getting over that a little bit. Um, was like, it's all coming down to this point right here. This is your bases loaded home run type deal. Like make it Baseball count. Reference. Don't let everything get in your brain and screw it up. Like concentrate mm-hmm. on just killing the deer. That's all you got to do right now is just kill this deer, you know, stay calm. If you're watching that deer for a long time, just think of anything else you have to do to keep your mind off from getting nervous. It's almost the toughest when you've got all that time to watch him. Yeah. I mean, that's like, yeah, if you're watching a deer in a field feed forever and he's working his way slowly to you and it's the deer Mm. you want, you know, that can really eat some people alive, you know? I think, I think, the, the, our mutual buddy Jim Tomey always says, "Slow the game down," and then I think of Pete Shepley in this instance of, over at PSE. He always said, "Give yourself a job, give yourself something to do." So you, you're taking your mind off of it almost. And in that regard, I always think about, "All right, making sure that I'm looking at where my next shooting lane is, what the range is on that shooting range, making sure for us the camera, you know, the tech cam or the whatever is on, making sure we're, you know, getting getting things ready. So it's almost like you're you're preoccupied versus just looking at the deer or looking at, you know, the rack or looking at whatever. It's it's like you're giving yourself a job and then I, I think about him and Jim in that instance because it's like you're giving yourself something to do and then you're slowing the game down by giving yourself something to do. It's like, all right, I got to make sure your, your checklist, your internal internal checklist, mm-hmm. it's like, all right, this is done, this is done, this is done, and um, and then we're ready. And, of course, it's easy to say all that, <clears throat> but but when, <laughs> yeah. you're, when you're getting in front of deer like Ben gets in front of or, or Mark or these guys and it's like a, a giant buck, well, it's, it's probably a lot different heightened sense. You know, it's, it's, I think it's all relative to what you're used to or what, no what your experience is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as you get to be a seat, you know, the more deer you kill, the more comfortable. That's why I tell a lot of people, that are new to bow hunting or, you know, struggling with that is to go shoot deer. Just go out and, you know, if you got some doe tags, just table the buck tag for a bit and go hunt, go hunt some deer just in general and make some kill shots, get your confidence up. You know, I think that's a great thing. It's just hunting deer in general and, uh, you know, making some good clean harvest that gives you a lot of confidence in your ability to shoot a bow, Mm -hmm. uh, any weapon, you know, and practicing at different angles in your yard, 
just anything like you need to do, I just think makes a big difference in that. And, you know, I agree with like Jim says, slow the game down. Like me, I'll think of my kids. I'll think if I'm really got a deer out there a long distance or something, but he's coming, I think of lots of different things. I try to just keep my eyes, you know, focused on what I need to, but yet in my mind, consciously, I'm like, man, you know, what do I got to do next week? I'm trying to, you know, I'm getting ready to kill this big deer here, hopefully. And then, uh, but try to think of other things to keep your mind, you know. I think one of the things that mess people up the most is these people are already tagging this deer and thinking about all their fucking <laughs> Guilty. And all the pictures they're going to take with it before they even shoot. I, I was that about to say that. Mm-hmm. Don't get ahead of yourself. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's, it's important not to get ahead of yourself because I, I almost feel like, the deer can almost sense it. it's like karma. It's you talk about now. karma. For me, it's it's a thing called karma. <laughs> and it's like once I start really getting confident, here he comes. It's, you know, it's all over. It, it, that's when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they just turn <laughs> and walk off. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So and, well, it, it, and I I don't I I do agree. I feel like deer can feel energy. Yeah. To a degree, like when you. You just ever have those days, man, you're like just feeling confident, you're just positive. It just seems like those nope. days are better in the woods. Yeah. You know, it's those days that you're just like dragging butt, you, you got a bad attitude. I just feel like you give off that same kind of, I don't know if deer can feel it or not, but I do feel like it affects my hunts. I just really do. The interesting part about that, sometimes it's happened to me where I go in like, you know, maybe you're grinding it out and you go in and it's like, man, I've, we, this is Groundhog's Day and nothing's mm-hmm. going to happen. We haven't been seeing anything. And then that's the moment, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because yeah. when you go in there and I've been, I, more times than not, I go in thinking, all right, this, this deer I got on camera, he's going to walk through right here Clockwork. and I get the shot and it never, ever, ever, mm-hmm. ever happens. And it's the day that I got a bad attitude about it mm-hmm. where all of a sudden something yep. does happen. So it's almost like, uh, you know, it's almost like a, a shift in like, hey, you're not in charge here. <laughs> Big time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, that Ben, so go yeah. ahead. Absolutely. So. As we uh, roll into September here for in the first week of September, uh, you've already been out on one hunt. I, Ohio doesn't open until October, though, right? Uh, yeah, it's like this year, though, it's actually really early. It's like September 23rd. Oh, really? Or 4th, which is the earliest it's ever been. Uh, just the way it's fallen on that Saturday. But yeah, it's going to I think the earliest I can ever remember was September 26th. Huh. I killed it here the first day. It was actually on one of your videos. So as you roll into this, then, uh, you know, the moon, moon phase, how much I know that you're, you know, the red moon and all that, you're, you're big into that as well. But what, what are you looking for here? Because the moon phase doesn't exactly line up great far into September, early October, maybe, you know, if we get a cool front might, might be pretty decent, but what are you looking at when you look at the calendar, look at the moon phase and say, okay, I, here's how I'm going to map out my fall from this state to this state to this state. I mean, how do you go about making your plans and does that play effect into it? Well, yeah, I mean, some, a lot of it depends on what deer I got, where they're at, like what state, you know, where's the first deer I want to target. And as of right now, you know, I don't, I've got a lot of nice deer, but I like out of state wise right now, I don't have anything located. That's just really flipping my trigger. Hmm. You know, I, they'll be back just right now. I think they're out there. You know, they're just, they haven't come home yet, you know, to the places I can hunt. Typically, as fall approaches, they start moving back. And I've, I've started to see some different bucks moving around, you know, which is telling me that, you know, just be patient. Something big's going to show. Uh, Ohio, I've got a fair bit of decent ones, you know, a couple nice ones that I'll definitely go after. So right now, my early efforts are going to be kind of focused towards Ohio at this point because I'm not going to travel out of state to mm-hmm. chase a maybe. You know, yeah. Um, so I will be looking at early season. You know, I like to see that moon. You know, like we've always talked. You know that. You know, rising. You know, or falling two hours before or after. You know, dark or before dark. It seems always to be good times. You know, for deer to move. Uh, to me, um, those little weather patterns. But you know, also you think about it in the summer deer are on their feet. I mean, you see deer in bean fields when it's 90 degrees out. Yeah. So I, mm-hmm. 
I, I still don't like just throw all of it out the window. Like, you know, I don't let the complete weather ruin it, but I do think it can make deer movement stagnant to a degree. Um, but that's where we go back to like, what are the things I've learned? I don't push the envelope on a big deer if things aren't lining up right. You know, mm -hmm. um, if it's, if the weather patterns are just horrible, the moon's horrible and like he's not moving a bunch, well then I'm not going to go push it, you know, and educate him. Yeah. Makes sense. So if you, you know, say you're getting pictures, it's, it's an hour before sunrise and it's consistent deers going back to bed wherever wherever that may be hour before sunrise he's just a nocturnal deer you, you always hear people say you know how do i make deer move during the daylight so do you do you look at that and say hey he might slip up we're real close to where i could catch him going back to bed or do you say no it's still too he's still too nocturnal i'm going to wait for for the right condition to go in there yeah I mean, if it's an hour, yeah, it's too, that's, that's not con conducive for me to say, yeah, I'm going to go hunting. Mm -hmm. One thing, one of the tactics I use a lot are I monitor scrapes on the edge of the fields and stuff, whether it's scrapes that I make myself and then they take them over or it's a scrape that they've started. If it's a scrape on a, you know, a secondary zone on the edge of a field or, you know, somewhere like that or like a transition zone, like maybe from bed to feed. If you can start, if you can monitor those areas a little bit and you can pick up deer moving in those magical times where like all of a sudden a big buck starts hitting a scrape right at daylight before he goes back to bed, he's going back to bed later. He's in that mood. I feel like that he's going to start walking his home turf a little bit, pushing the other bucks out because, you know, they, they want to be the big boy. Um, and they want to show their dominance and it just gets in their hormones a little bit. I usually see that start happening about that October 16th to the 23rd. I've had a lot of luck killing big deer right hmm. then on that same tactic, like get in there on some scrapes um, before they get full seeking phase and scrapes don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Ben, how, how much do you find that bucks will use the same scrapes year after year? Oh, a lot, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's certain scrapes that I call just primary scrapes, you know, community scrapes that all the deer use. And then you'll have some scrapes that will be close to a buck's bed, core area. That's his scrape. Other bucks might tear into it a little bit, but typically they don't. But that's a way you could dupe a big deer, too, is like if you've got a buck that you know that's his scrape, he's the one opening that scrape up all the time, and you go in there and you put some different buck urine in it, you know, like I use Black Widow Sensei, I use like Dominator or something. He thinks it's another deer using his core scrape. It, it makes them upset. They'll start checking that scrape first thing when they get out of bed because they want to see if they can, they either want to mark it or mm -hmm. they want to see if they can run into that deer. Mm -hmm. so, so one thing you can do too is take dirt. Like you got another scrape, a farm that's got a bunch of scrapes on it. Take some of that dirt, throw it in a bucket all those other deer peed and urinated that scrape and take it to your other farm and dump one under that scrape yeah, and, tricky. Watch, and watch what happens. Do they just light it up? <laughs> they, they destroy it. That's interesting. That, that's one of the little tactics I've always held under my chest, but I've had so many people this year saying how they appreciate that I give up my secrets. And so they're like, man, we just love that you don't charge for your knowledge. And so I kind of was like, you know what, maybe they're right. You know, the good Lord's given me a gift. So, I might as well share it. If we can help somebody kill the biggest deer in their life, good for them. So are you not my neighbor? Are you doing that this <laughs> this course. time of year or are you waiting until October to start doing that kind of stuff? Yeah, I usually wait till it's a deer I'm trying to kill, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not in that mood yet. Like it's it's like tactic that I want to get in there, I'm gonna hunt him for three or four days and I'm gonna use that tactic, you know, type of thing. Uh but, you know, deer lures can do the same thing. That's, you know, that's a tactic that I used to use a lot before I really became confident in good deer lure because so much deer lure out there is junk. It just sits on the shelf in Walmart for day, you know, for years, collects dust, you know, they don't. So it's real imperative to use super fresh deer urines. 
and uh, you know, good lure, not just I don't know what you call it, just you know, stuff that's not fresh and not good. I've I've so, wondered about the shelf life on that kind of stuff. Yeah. So like, and I I'm not trying to plug somebody on your show, but you know, the reason that Black Widow is one of my sponsors, why I've loved it so much, is because you know, because I was skeptical. You know, I was always a trapper and I knew good lure meant the difference, but I'd never, I never used deer lure that worked. Well, the thing with Black Widow is, is they actually, they don't want the lure on the shelf. They have a program with their dealers that if they don't sell the lure by the end of fall, they take it back hmm. and they, they give their dealers money back on that product because they do not want it sitting on the shelf. It's fresh every year. And I really have seen a huge difference in that. And there's no doubt in my mind that Black Widow, you know, using it as like cover scent at times or getting deer downwind to me and spraying it in the air has calmed does down hmm. that allowed me to, you know, end up getting a shot at a buck or just different things like that. I mean, it really does work. I've always tried sourcing it myself. It's really difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you ever messed with synthetic? Uh synthetic urine or anything like that because they i know that that's like there's some states where you can't use that stuff and so then synthetic sides become a bigger part of the industry yeah it has and, and you know they make some of that too uh black widow does and i mean it's it's pretty good but i haven't used it a ton because i haven't had to yeah uh, but i've done some smell tests with it myself and it's really hard to determine the difference so i think what it really takes is I think you just have to have a manufacturer that really cares about their product. You know, um, it seems like when you get a deer lure company that's owned by a company that owns say 30 other products in the outdoor industry, those are one of those companies that the deer lure is probably not going to be the best in my opinion. <laughs> um, you know, that's just being truthful, you know, like black widow, that's all they do. Yeah. Is deer pee. Well, that's, certainly you know. something to be said about focusing in on one, area yeah. and being great at it yeah your slogan yeah. is all we do is pee <laughs> yeah but <laughs> yeah. we've been we've kind of been asking all of our guests since it's it's we're approaching early season here are you an early season doe shooter an early season what doe will you take a doe in early season oh yeah oh yeah i'll pound crap out yeah <laughs> it sounds like a, like an old man winner <laughs> yeah i mean i just yeah i mean if i can and if I, especially if I'm not on a deer, I, I go hunt those, you know, mm -hmm. I, I find it very fun. It's a confidence booster in your shooting abilities, uh, you know, and we need to harvest does, you know, I mean, it's, you can't just be a buck hunter, you know, we need to do our part. And, uh, I, I sometimes almost feel like you can't shoot enough of them. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. Yeah, I know that's not truth in some areas, but like a lot of the areas that I have, there's just too many, you know. Sure. So is there a cutoff on when you stop going, you know, when it's like, all right, now I got to kind of switch focus. And, and I guess once you start getting pictures of a deer that you feel like you're about to start really honing in on maybe. Well, and there, there's certain areas of farms I won't shoot a doe, you know, like for sure. Like I try to do, I try to literally set stands and and do situations where I can shoot them on the very front of the farm or in areas that I can make it easy access to, you know, with a pickup truck. So I'm not, so the deer, like you're not alerting the bucks that you're being, that you're out there hunting, yeah. you know? Um, so it's, you know, whether it's a water source that you've put in way up front on the edge somewhere and bucks usually aren't going to hit that until dark, but the does will come to it or like, you know, Ohio, you can bait deer. I don't like to bait deer, but sometimes, you know, that's a real effective tactic of keeping your does under control, you know, sprinkling a little corn or big tine somewhere in an area that you can get those deer to come to real easy to harvest a doe or two and you don't impact your farm whatsoever. Makes sense. Gotcha. Well, our question of the day this week has to do with killing bucks. So I figure that Ben would be a great uh, guest to help answer this question. Certainly wouldn't be one of those episodes where it's just you and I. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. All right. So the question of the day is probably brought to you by DeerCast Rain Stations. Prep your locations to perfection with historical, current, and forecasted precipitation amounts. Well, one of my biggest things 
ever since I started deer hunting is seven years I have never shot a buck. All my buddies have all these big bucks on their wall, 10, 12 pointers, and every time I would see one, it was always too young, too small. So basically I've been tagging out on does. That's from Timothy Alsip. You know, tough, tough. Seven years. Well, well we don't yeah. really have enough of the picture to know what, what, how much acreage he's on. What's he, you know, what, where's he at? What's he hunting? What, you know, does he have any food plots? I mean, there's a lot of factors that could potentially play into this. Mm-hmm. But Ben, what do you, I mean, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts on what Tim said here? Well, I would say, you know, it sounds to me like maybe, you know, he's obviously seen some bucks where he's hunted, just not the right ones. I would say it's time to, you know, think that over, think that process over and be like, okay, either I just don't have those kind of deer here and I need to, to find a different place to hunt. You know, Tennessee is not necessarily known as a giant buck killing state, but now it's getting a lot more reputation of having better deer. Um, so I'm sure there's areas that the deer are better or bigger, mm-hmm. or maybe he's just, you know, alerting the deer to his presence. He's hunting too much. Like they know he's there. There's a lot of factors that can play into that. Um, but I would say, you know, he needs to to spend a little more time scouting for the right buck sign and then trying to hunt that fresher buck sign as, you know, the fall gets here. And I would think he would do better at seeing the right kind of buck. Now, I don't know if he's only gun hunting or if he's bow hunting or what he's doing, but, you know, it's hard to go wrong on big sign mid-October to like that 25th area. Those deer are still using that sign at that point. You're talking scrapes and rubs and, you yeah, know, that scrapes, kind of Yeah, scrapes, rubs, big tracks, you know, on main trails to and from doe bedding areas, things like that. The, the thing you got to be careful, though, like if all of a sudden you're walking around your property at that time of year looking for the sign, I mean, you kind of really got to – I don't know, man. It's one of those deals where I, I try to, like, put out – a couple of cameras this time of year that and if you can afford one you know a cell camera would help mm-hmm. where you don't have to go back in and and yeah. disturb things and maybe it's an area where you feel like hey I, this is where they're typically moving through let's set up a trail camera and then hey if i start getting daylight pictures or or pictures of a, of a bigger buck then hone in on it mm-hmm. but I, I i wonder this if he's never killed a buck well, he didn't say that. I guess he, I, we don't know if he's ever killed a buck at all or if he just hadn't killed a big buck. But would you, you know, seven years isn't a long time hunting. I know he's, he's, a, he's a, you know, obviously he's not a, he's not a kid. He's a man. But mm-hmm. I mean, I hunted five years before I ever killed anything. Like, do you, do you all of a sudden say, you know what, maybe I just need to kill, get one under the belt before, <laughs> but before I get ahead of myself and try to kill a mature buck. I, I mean, does yeah. that ever play into it? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's, you know, I agree with what you're saying uh, 100%. It, I'm sure I'm sure it's tough because of the friends. If all the friends got a big deal oh, on the yeah. wall and the shit that you might take, mm-hmm. you know, so there's that. that's a factor. Alan's shaking and his if, head, yes. And if you're married, your wife's like, ah, oh, going chasing uh, your magic beans again, huh? Yeah, so, I, you know, it's tough, but I, I don't know, man. You, it's We always say, hey, you can't kill them, the, the old deer, if you shoot the young ones. But sometimes if you've never killed any, maybe you just ought to get one under your belt. Break the ice. And then just don't tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing is, as, as a hunter, I feel like you can't really own anything. Like you have to be willing to, to analyze everything that you're doing, whether it's access, hanging, where you're hanging your trail cameras, uh, how you're hunting the wind, how you're moving, even how you're moving in the stand, maybe you're, you're moving too much and you're getting picked off. So you're saying it's you, you know, you <laughs> as all, the hunter. It's, all, it's yeah. always us. I mean, now if, if you're hunting a place that just doesn't have any deer, there's nothing you can do at that point. But, but as a hunter, I think you just have to continuously be okay with jettisoning other, you know, parts of your method in, in favor of something that is going to help you more. So, so maybe you're, you know, say, you spook a doe, doe gets downwind, you hunt it on the wrong wind, whatever. 
you don't know what was coming out. You know, the yeah. the buck usually isn't the first one out. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. Yeah, and, and so so learn from that. You, you have to be willing to learn from stuff. Otherwise, you're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. And it's tough, and it's and it's demoralizing, and your time is too valuable to keep doing that. And and seriously, it's not an ad for DeerCast, but learn from the stuff, like learn from the videos, and the timing in DeerCast. That's going to help you avoid making a lot of those mistakes that a lot of us had to make in the process of of becoming a deer hunter. Absolutely, so, Timothy. Thank you for the question. If you want to get a hold of me via the Rack Pack, we'll send you out a 100% Wild Podcast hat. And uh, keep us posted. Want to know how your fall goes this year? Hopefully, you know. Hopefully Hopefully this is the year. Yeah, no doubt. Wildlife Word, it's brought to you by DeerCast Windcheck. Scout and access your trail cams with confidence using DeerCast Windcheck. All right, Ben, prepare to have your mind blown by Tim's wildlife word. Mm-hmm. It's usually a phrase. You might want to pull over. <laughs> Our question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so besides us hunters... What other organism loves velvet bucks? Is it A, raccoons, B, turkey vultures, C, possums, or D, ticks? What other organism loves velvet bucks? Yeah, well, I mean, a tick loves a deer any time of year. Um, That right. I do know that some of them critters like that velvet if they can get their hands on it but a lot of the bucks eat that velvet. So I don't know. I guess that'd be a tough one. I guess I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say vultures because it seems like a lot of velvet bucks seem to get sick or they're really susceptible for some reason. When they die, the vultures love that. Okay. Did you say that bucks eat the velvet? Yeah, I've actually seen them eat the velvet. Like if it's dripping and hanging in their face, I've actually seen them eat it. It's nutritious. Wow, I've never, I've never heard that before. Does will eat their own placenta. Yeah, okay. It's like it's like a cow giving birth. You know, on a mm. dairy farm growing up, you know, I'd watch cows. They'd give birth and they'd end up eating that. Do we have any B-roll of this? <laughs> Sounds horrible. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you say what other organism? Loves velvet bucks. Yeah, I guess I guess vulture is not an organism. Well, is tick is ticks not all organisms? Are, are they? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, Tim. <laughs> You're not a scientist. <laughs> okay, just for this one day. I thought maybe that was like a trick. <laughs> mm, no, I'm not that clever. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go with ticks. Okay, Matt, you win the deer cast hat. It's ticks. suck it, Ben. <laughs> now, <laughs> now if well, if I was right, I just thought well, there's no way it could be that easy. If uh, if uh, if if any of these other animals were to encounter velvet somehow and they could get it, I'm sure they would eat it. But uh, but yeah, ticks are because there's so much blood flow that close to the surface. Ticks love velvet. That's what she said. Boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So like, so I mean, do they actually like? Do the ticks actually go after the velvet? Well, they. Has anybody ever like documented ticks buried into velvet antlers? There's uh, there's there's a few guys that were as I was doing some research for this, we're talking about how when they kill velvet bucks, that they're very cautious about holding the velvet, not just for the sake that it's so fragile, but it all. But there's also lots of ticks in them. And usually, when a deer dies, it seems like ticks know, okay, we're on a sinking ship, it's time to abandon, and then they start looking for Crawl up a your, new place your to hand uh, and yeah. your arm. <laughs> That's why you'll never see me throw a deer over my shoulders and walk out of the woods. Right, the other day, yeah. Yeah, that and I couldn't do it. <laughs> That Those hernia is. <laughs> the other day, Scott and I were at the farm putting up trail cameras, and all of a sudden, my arm was like, I mean, on fire. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm, it, I'm itching, I'm itching, I'm itching. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, you know, and I was sawing some limbs and, you know, getting some uh-huh. stuff situated for one of these cameras. I'm like, I thought it was like maybe just dust, for sawdust or whatever. And I'm looking closer, and all of a sudden, they start moving. Yeah. It was, it was either, it was either like the tiniest seed tick I've ever seen in my life, and like I'm talking like 20, 30 of them, yeah, or chiggers, or I don't know Probably what. Probably seed ticks. I, and they, I, we had to get duct tape and get the damn yeah, things off. I, hate I was that. my legs, my yes. hands, and I had permethrin on and all kinds of stuff, and I was just covered up in them, man. Nasty. And it just itch, itch, itch for yeah. like the next ten days, man. Had looked like I had chicken pox. That's nasty. Yeah, I hate those things. <laughs> yeah, the worst. Ugh. 
So that'll be my, the last uh, time my, I do that this year. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, my camera guy, he just got blasted with chiggers the last time we were out uh, in Illinois and Missouri, you know, back in early July. I mean, he got covered in them. Mm. And it's, they were buried, buried in his legs for ugh. a week and a half, two weeks. It's brutal, too. I mean, it, it is an uh, uncomfortable, <laughs> itchy feeling. The, the worst is when you see, like, the brown smudge, and it looks like dirt, but then the dirt starts moving. Yeah. yeah well, that's <laughs> yeah. that's probably 2,000 seed ticks Scott, right there. Scott kept saying, he's like, I don't think so. And I'm like, look, see, it's moving. He's They're like, moving. I don't think so. And then we got the duct tape out and started peeling them off, and then they start moving on uh, that. I'm like, I knew it. <laughs> so Nasty. Yeah. All right. So uh, what's next, Tim? Let's do some shout outs. So uh, we got a shout out from a listener. He said, uh, just listen to Mark and Terry uh, with Dr. Bronson Strickland on the 100% Wild podcast. You guys are the consummate professionals. I'm a big believer in DeerCast and the jury research. Loved how they welcomed and discussed what could have been discounting the data. I'm a Southeast Missouri fan and jury supporter. Thanks, Bobby. So, so Ben, we had uh, Dr. Bronson on um maybe two weeks ago or so. And he, he has some research out there about just kind of in general deer movement, whitetail movement. And he had a, a study that took place in Oklahoma, uh, him and several other researchers. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was really interesting because it kind of showcased that deer, that weather didn't affect deer movement. And as you dive in, so we, we had him on the podcast and Mark and Terry, and of course, everything we do is based as you are as well yep. is based around weather and little changes in the weather and how that affects deer movement. But as we dug into it, the research was much more broad and you know, the collars that the deer were wearing, it was, it was only getting pinged every 15 minutes and it would only show up if they moved, I think over 75 to hundred yards or, or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so as you really dug into it, it kind of, not to say we poked holes through it, but it was a different kind of a study than I think what a, a deer hunter is really looking for. And that's kind of what we came up with. It'd be really interesting to have, uh, you know, several deer collared for a full season, not a full, you know, several years and ping it every minute mm -hmm. and yeah. see what kind of movement you're getting on those weather factors. I mean, in your, your opinion, you know, what, what are some of the major things that make deer move during the fall? Well, um, you know, obviously girls, but you know, they, deer are a creature of habits. They got to drink, they got to eat every day. You know, they got to stay alive. They like to bed in certain spots. Deer move every day of their life. I don't care. You know, they're going to move at some point, whether that distance is very far that day can determine, be determined by a lot of different factors, you know, but. I still feel like, dang it, sorry. I still feel like every day they got to move, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, if a, a radio collar deer is being tracked and it's only, the collar's only pinging every 10 or 15 minutes, well, I feel like that, that could be a little more of a general study of deer movement. Like, do they leave their core area and travel miles or, you know, but big mature white tails you know for us kind of guys 150 to 200 yard movement is all you really need sometimes and mm -hmm. that can be determined by a weather front or you know a moon phase or something like that food source that you know just that little bit of movement can be the, the difference between success and failure yep yeah, that's kind of what that's kind of the I think that was the basis of like, hey, 75 yards when you're already in their kitchen, it's, it means a lot. Yeah. And, and his general yeah. premise, I don't think it was something that we would disagree with that primarily movement happens in those twilight hours. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, that that's kind of a given. But for us, it's like, but we want that extra edge. Are they going to move a little bit at noon or are they going to move yeah. a little bit earlier today than yesterday? So, yeah, it was it was oh, interesting. Yeah. Have you guys ever noticed, though, like on your trail cameras where you're driving around the middle of the day and all of a sudden there's deer in a field and then you drive a little ways and there's another deer yeah. in the field? That's not coincidence, man. Like deer don't just decide to get up all at the same time and like they're all on a deer clock and go, hey, boys, time to get up for a little bit. <laughs> I want that you clock. Know? It's uh, it's there's influences, you know, and I, I'm not smart enough to know exactly what those influences are. 
but a lot of times I'll stop when I see deer in the middle of the day at one o'clock or two o'clock and they're out in a field or there's deer feeding in people's yards or something like that. A lot of times if you look in the sky, you'll see the moon. Yeah. You know, it could be a falling moon or a rising moon or, you know, like on your trail cameras when the moon is like half, you know, half full, half dark, you know, a lot of times you'll see a lot of daylight movement out of mature bucks. Well, and, and, and Bronson said there's there's some kind of magic. There's something that even the scientists don't understand because as a hunter, he's like, yeah, I see movement at different times of day that as a scientist, I can't explain. Mm-hmm. So there's some X factor still at play. So he l- certainly left the door open for that. All right. Speaking of an open door, <clears throat> we got an open door over in Rack Pack. Yeah. So the Rack Pack, if you ever want to join, it's a private Facebook group. And all you got to do is type in 100% Wild Rack Pack or Drew Outdoors Rack Pack. It'll come up. You answer a few questions, and boom, you're in. Every week, Tim lists out a bunch of names of new members. Every week, he throws in a fake one. Every week, I butcher these names. All right, so we have Andrea Rothov. Rothov? Rothov? Maybe Rothov. <laughs> what would Maybe you say? Smith? <laughs> I, I would probably say Rothov. Okay, that's not an easy one. Man. No. And I think it's a girl. Where's the emphasis, Andrea? <laughs> All right, we got Patrick Clark. That one's easy. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Wes the Fox. That may be okay. fake. Yeah, Robbie not. Rollins. <laughs> Austin Feltz. Kurt Middendorf the second. He's Boom. fancy. <laughs> Esquire. <laughs> Real wow. fancy. We got a fancy pants in the rack pack. Man. And then we got Brandon Woby and Bo Buffett. Bo Buffett. Hmm. Bo right. Buffett. <laughs> I'm going with the fake name as this may come to as you as a surprise to you i'm not i think west the fox is real i'm going with bo buffett <laughs> you gotta get you gotta guess there ben uh i would say bo buffet yeah yeah <laughs> uh, bo got it sure uh, ben got it and so did you yeah star wars boba fett there you go ah, nice <laughs> <laughs> i am a fan of the wars <laughs> uh yes i love the star Trek. <laughs> okay I want to know who the hell Wes the Fox is. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. That's that, that was his handle on Facebook. <laughs> Fancy. It's cool. All right. Cool name. So what's up, Tim? Mm. Are we done now? Can we go home? <laughs> yeah, we can. All right, good. <laughs> so so let's do that. Um, uh, appreciate everyone watching. Please subscribe to the show. Ben, yeah. if they want to find you, where do they find you at? Uh, whitetailedge.com. Uh, Anywhere, you know, between find you can find us now on Deercast, mm-hmm. and you can find us uh, YouTube, Masio Go, just Whitetail Edge. They'll, they'll find us, and I, you know, I do. It's been great the relationship that we've got going again. You know, I just want to say thanks to all you guys for that too, and it's it's kind of great to rub shoulders again like we are and be able to uh, cohort a little bit and. It's just nice to be able to help each other out. You know? that, that's that's right. We love having you in there. And I think the, the key there is, you know, getting people into DeerCast that, you know, can give people, again, I'll say it, the edge in trying to figure out how to kill a whitetail. We heard the question of the day from Tim. And, I mean, this is – that's a – that's not an uncommon problem that Tim has there and he's not alone. And so I think the purpose of DeerCast is getting like-minded people in there and sharing some information on how to, Mm -hmm. how are you succeeding? How are you, what, what are some tips that I can use to get a little bit of an edge to kill a whitetail and having you guys in there, it's, it's a great addition. I've noticed too, that I really enjoy about the DeerCast app is the, the people that are on deer cast and that are commenting and following and posting, man, there, there's hardly any negativity ever. It's not like Facebook or some of the other social networks where, you know, well, why did your arrow penetrate far enough? <laughs> or, you know, it's more guys like, Hey, you know, mistakes happen. Sorry, you missed your buck, but way to stick after it. Yeah. It's a lot of encouraging good comments, yeah. you know, um, a lot of positive type people and it's it's kind of addicting actually i, I find myself rather looking at that than because i hate facebook and instagram yeah. personally i only did it only ever started a white tail edge page just because we had to for sponsorships yeah but um i just can't stand it sometimes the things that people will say like literally take the time to type that out <laughs> you know so i really like reading the comments on deercast because everybody seems to be so 
uh, supportive and good. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it, I'm sure there's could be some negative times, but I haven't seen it. It's rare. It is rare. It's it's few and far between, and these guys do a good job of moderating comments. And we get, you know, if something strange does pop up and somebody's, you know, kind of a knucklehead in there, we have other deer casters that are that. reporting yeah. them and, and there's a report feature and it's very rare though. I mean, overall mm -hmm. the whole point and premise of having that news feed and a social kind of feature to the app was having a positive place for hunters to go. And so it's, it's succeeded in that so far. Yeah. So that's been nice. Most of the comments we moderate are from you and yeah. Alan. <laughs> it's weird. Making fun of you. Okay. <laughs> I don't like it. I'm well, yeah, and I mean, it's, It's great, though, because, like, you know, I wish the hunting community in general, yeah, we can all have disagreements and we can voice our opinion, but being rude or taking tearing somebody down, that, that doesn't do any good. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, mm -hmm. you may think something, you can think it, but you don't always have to spell it out or write it out. It's like, you know, um, in fact, especially if you can't on the spell same it team out. If we're on a hunting page. I, I just often wonder what kind of person that is anyways, because I couldn't think of any subject where I would go off on somebody I didn't know on online, but mm -hmm. whatever, yeah, that's unhappy. just me. They're unhappy <laughs> so, people. Okay. All right. That's what I was going to say. Most of the time it's people. I've found out that most of the people that make negative comments to something that I do, it's typically because I make them feel bad <laughs> because they can't kill a deer like I do or you do or Mark or Tim or, you know, there's just something about them that they're not happy with. So they have to say something in a sense that makes themselves feel better. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. that, and that's in a lot of stuff, you know, sports, it can be anything, but oh, yeah. and it's sad. I feel bad for those people. You wish, you wish they didn't feel that way. Well, you know? the difference is if they met you in person and talked to you and had a conversation, they never say the things they were saying. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Different story. Okay. Uh, well, right. thanks so much, Ben. We appreciate it, man. Ben, Good luck this fall. We hope to have you on again here uh, in a few weeks, maybe after you've killed a giant whitetail that just showed up on your trail cameras. And we can talk crap about you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> All right. See you, man. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Good All luck, right, buddy. Care, All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, All right. Until next time. Now we say goodbye to all of you fine people. Peace out. DeerCast is now supercharged with maps. Get ahead of your game with killer new features like live Doppler radar, wind check out to five days, virtual rain gauges, GPS path tracking, and more. Plus, get our 14-day revolutionary DeerCast prediction and access to DeerCast track. Prep, predict, and pursue with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's.